Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Cohn. It's 12 o'clock. Um, so we will officially open the uh, day two of the ACIP meeting. I did, before I hand it over to our chair, Dr. Lee, want to let everybody know that the updated agenda is available on the ACIP website, uh, where you will see a list of the presentations um, and the uh, items under discussion for today. Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks, Dr. Cohn. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Today is September 23rd, 2021, and I will now call our ACIP meeting to order. Um, Dr. Cohn just offered her announcement, so we're going to move right into roll call uh, of our members uh, uh, only. And for ACIP members, I'll just remind you to state your name, affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts of interest. And I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order. So, Dr. Talbot. You caught Dr. Talbot off guard because she's always. I did. I knew. I knew that would happen. <laughs> go ahead, Dr. Talbot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine and um, health policy at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I study vaccines in older in older adults. Thank you. Um, any conflicts? No conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Move to Dr. Paling. Good morning, Dr. Lee. This is Kathy Palin, um, a professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Oh, okay. We'll move on to Dr. Long. Sarah Long, good morning, afternoon. I am a pediatric infectious disease doctor, professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine. I have no conflict. Uh, thank you. Dr. Lair. Dr. Jamie Lair, family medicine, Ithaca, New York, private practice, no conflict. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. Hello, Camille Cotton. I am the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host Infectious Disease at Massachusetts General Hospital and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. No conflict. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Uh, uh, hello, Matt Daly, Senior Investigator, Institute for Health Research, Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, University of Colorado School of Medicine. No conflicts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll go back to Ms. McNally. Morning, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Um, Dr. Seneas. Good morning. I am Sybil Seneas. I am an internist and pediatrician and an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. I have no conflicts. Uh, thank you. Dr. Chen? Wilbur Chen, Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and a member of the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. I have no conflicts. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Brooks? Oliver Brooks, Chief Medical Officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation. I have no conflicts. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brooks. Dr. Bell? Beth Bell, Clinical Professor, Department of Global Health, University of Washington, no conflicts. Thank you. Ms. Bata? Good morning, Lynn Bata, Immunization Clinical Consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Alt? My name is Kevin Alt. I'm a Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Kansas School of Medicine in Kansas City, Kansas, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to Dr. Sanchez. Okay, we'll come back to Dr. Sanchez. Um, and uh, I am Grace Lee, uh, one of the ACIP members. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, associate CMO for Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. Today, we're going to actually um, 
start out with a, a few announcements. Uh, and uh, before we officially start, I'm going to ask uh, first Dr. Doran Fink to comment on FDA's actions to set the, set the stage for today. And then uh, we are pleased to have the director of the CDC, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, um, who will speak briefly after Dr. Fink. So Dr. Fink, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, and good morning. Uh, so uh, late yesterday, uh, FDA uh, amended the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine to include use of a single booster dose administered at least six months after the primary series in the following populations. Individuals 65 years of age and older, individuals 18 through 64 years of age at high risk of severe COVID-19, and individuals 18 through 64 years of age whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus puts them at high risk of serious complications of COVID-19, including severe COVID-19. This was a regulatory uh, action that followed FDA's uh, comprehensive and independent review of clinical trial data submitted by the vaccine manufacturer, uh, as well as additional information concerning vaccine effectiveness uh, from real world uh, evidence observational studies, uh, both in the US as well as outside the US uh, presented and discussed at the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting last Friday. Uh, additionally, the FDA uh, decision and uh, construction of the uh, authorized population for the booster dose took into account uh, the feedback and recommendations that we received from the members of the VERPAC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fink, um, and we appreciate all of the work that you've uh, done to date and continue to do for our country. Um, I would like to turn it over to the director of the CDC, Dr. Rochelle Walensky. We're so pleased to have you on today, and I know she would like to say a few words to the committee before we get started. So, Dr. Walensky, the floor is yours. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me start with just a huge thank you to all of you. Over the past year, you have met 18 times mostly focused on COVID-19 and recommendations for vaccinations. This is a tremendous amount of work, a tremendous amount of data to review, and in truth, a tremendous service. So thank you. You're tasked with difficult decisions, weighing the risks and benefits, extrapolating from sometimes the wealth and sometimes the paucity of data available, applying an equity lens to your actions, and doing all of this while reflecting on your own experiences on the pandemic front lines. What's been your North Star and what drives my own thinking every day is a commitment to follow the science to improve the health of as many Americans as possible. Like you, I'm approaching this decision with an interest in doing what's right for the public health. And like you, I can't close my eyes to my experience as a clinician. Collectively, we want to do what's right for the millions of Americans over the age of 65 and in long-term care facilities who are at high risk of severe complications of COVID-19. And like you, I'm also thinking about the 25-year-old man with cystic fibrosis who may walk into our clinic, nervous about his risk for one more hospitalization. And also of the 35-year-old pregnant resident physician working in a Tennessee emergency room with a one-year-old at home. It's in these complicated decisions where ACIP has always led, valuing safety, equity, and access for those at risk, and it's here where I am most grateful for your guidance. I appreciate your meticulous review of the data available from CDC's own cohort studies, from FDA's review of Pfizer studies, and from public health partners and institutions around the world. These data are not perfect, yet collectively they form a picture for us, and they are what we have in this moment to make a decision about the next stage in this pandemic. Thank you for leaning into this complexity, trying to fit the pieces together and to come to the best conclusion. I've spoken with you previously and I hope some of you have heard some of my other public remarks. 
What you're doing today is an essential part of the process. A thorough evaluation of data by this full committee is how we maintain a system that maximizes safety, ensures effectiveness, lets data drive our decisions, and provides confidence to the American people. It's also how we strive to implement interventions that are equitable. Back in December, before I was even here, you created a blueprint for the country and the world. One that may ensure those at greatest risk for disease, whether because of their age, their underlying conditions, or occupational exposure, had access to the most effective intervention we have to prevent symptomatic disease, severe disease, and illness, death from COVID-19. Now, you have an opportunity to again lead our public health response with recommendations on how we can best utilize the tools we have to protect those at greatest risk. As you continue your discussion today, I make three commitments to you. First, as we move into a new stage of this pandemic and our vaccination program, I will not lose sight of our collective goal to protect as many people as possible from COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and death. That means that as we operationalize a plan to provide booster doses to Americans, we remain committed to continuing our robust efforts to vaccinate as many people as possible here in America and around the world, and to continue to support and disseminate the public health interventions that we know work best to prevent disease. I see these as complementary. One can simply not replace the others. Second, we all recognize that the science and data of COVID-19 are moving faster than any data we've ever seen before. And while I re recognize the tremendously heavy lift of the past year, we all know that the pace is unlikely to let up anytime soon. We will continue this dialogue. You will have more data to review and more recommendations to make, and I will be here with you. And third, the discussion of the data is critical. My clinical experience reminds me that in my most challenging cases, I learned more and made better clinical decisions by discussing with my colleagues. By hearing their points of view from their own clinical experience and review of the medical literature that I might not have considered. My academic experience reminds me that in every research conference, I was enriched by hearing diverse perspectives. While we all plan to provide clear and aligned recommendations, the underlying discussion of diverse opinions and interpretations of the data only serves to strengthen our ultimate guidance. You have a busy afternoon ahead of you, a lot of data to review, and a robust discussion to ensue. I will let you get to it, and I will be watching and listening. Know that I am grateful for your efforts and that I so appreciate your expertise, your counsel, and your partnership. Thank you. I'll now turn things back to Dr. Cohn. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walensky, um, for your incredible service to the public and for your leadership during these challenging times. Uh, and we, we at the ACIP, or the committee, really appreciates how much you've done to ensure that we continue to maintain a robust process for decision making today. Um, so we will proceed and continue on with the session, uh, starting with Dr. Matt Daly, who will provide a brief introduction. And uh, after that, we will move to public comment. So Dr. Daly, are you available? I am. Um, hello, I'm going to introduce the session today um, and uh, um, the uh, conversation that follows is a reflection of the work of the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to read this verbatim, um, even though Dr. Fink has already mentioned this, because obviously this sets the context for the conversation that follows. As Dr. Fink said, the FDA expanded um, Pfizer BioNTech emergency use authorization to include a single booster dose to be administered at least six months after completion of the primary series in individuals 65 years of age and older, individuals 18 through 64 years of age at high risk for severe COVID-19, and individuals 18 through 64 years of age whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2 puts them at high risk of serious complications of COVID-19, including severe COVID-19. Next slide. So this is the agenda for today. Um, 
Next, we're going to have a public comment period. After that, there will be a break. After the break, we'll hear from Dr. Wallace, who will present COVID-19 vaccine booster doses, benefit risk. After Dr. Wallace's presentation, we'll hear from Dr. Oliver, who will present the evidence to recommendations framework. After Dr. Oliver, we'll hear from Dr. Dooling, who will present con clinical considerations with respect to the use of booster doses in the United States, followed by Dr. Oliver, who will present the policy options. We will then have discussion. After the discussion, we will have a vote on BNT162B2 COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to thank the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group, including ACIP members, ex officio and government members, um, CDC leads, Dr. Sarah Oliver and Dr. Kathleen Dooling, as well as liaisons and our consultants. Next slide, please. Um, and then I'd also like to thank all of the CDC participants listed here who contributed countless hours to prepare materials for the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group to review. Next slide. Uh, thanks very much. I turn it back to you, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, so for the start of the public comment session, which will begin now, um, I'd like to welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today and also um, those who provided written public comment through the regulations.gov website on the CDC docket 2021-0104. All of the speakers today submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited public comment period, and in order to make it through all the listed speakers, it's extremely important that each speaker limits his or her remarks to three minutes. We will be displaying a timer on the screen so you know how much time you have left. Um, thank you again to our speakers, and we look forward to your comments. So um, I will uh, call them in order as given to me. Uh, first, we have um, Mr. Kermit Kubitz. Mr. Kubitz, are you? Okay, perfect. Please go ahead. Mr. Can Kermit. you hear me? Now we can. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kermit Kubitz. Uh, I look at things from the point of view of a scientifically trained graduate of Caltech a long time ago. I believe booster shots of mRNA vaccines are valuable, safe, and justified. Relying principally, for example, today on Gruber's September 22nd slides, CC7 and CC8, showing a large increase in protection after the third dose within seven days and a further increase uh, one month after the third dose, including against the Delta variant as shown on slide CC8. I have previously testified in support of EUA of the Pfizer vaccine in December 2020 and subsequently received the Moderna vaccine at a San Francisco VA hospital facility in Fort Miley in uh, February 2020. I have two sisters in the late 80s who have been vaccinated. One immunocompromised with rheumatoid arthritis received a booster dose with no significant adverse effects. So I also rely on that personal experience. Uh, my friend Chuck Wolf from Caltech pointed out to me that we need to plan for the logistics of boosters with three priorities. One, the unvaccinated, two, children six to 11, and three, boosters for other people. Uh, approval of phase boosters for those over 65 and high risk, including from occupational exposure, is not inconsistent with President Biden's goal of boosters for all Americans, because Healthcare workers, the elderly, first line essential workers, uh, and those who are at high risk easily exceed 150 million people, which will take time to roll out. So we should plan, and the CDC and FDA should plan for batched vaccination 
healthcare workers in groups, long-term care facilities in groups, and uh, other rollout that is the most expeditious way of getting boosters out there, including, for example, to my veteran friends at the veterans clinics in, uh, across the country. And I want to thank the ACIP for their, for their work and, uh, and suggest that uh, it is important to also approve the Moderna mRNA vaccine as soon as possible so that the uh, logistics of boosters can be easily accomplished for the maximum number of at-risk people at the earliest possible date. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next, we have Mr. Edward Nuremberg. Uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've had the honor of addressing you before, and I'm grateful to be able to speak to you again. I want to thank every member of ACIP once more for their stalwart efforts in leading us through these trying times. But I would like to draw attention to how those who wish to keep the pandemic burning through the U.S. are exploiting public comments. There are deceptive videos and papers featuring overconfident, undereducated, and well-funded charlatans who use the opportunity of public comments to advance arguments at ACIP or FERPAC meetings as though from authority. Some of the videos in particular use FDA or CDC logos to provide their similitude of authenticity. All use the docket number format of written comment submission to provide the .gov URL as a way to convince their acolytes that their counterfactual presentations are bombshell revelations from the government rather than the sophomoric meanderings of desperate hucksters that they actually are. It is heartbreaking to me that in my outreach for vaccination, I've yet to encounter someone who's refused vaccination on the basis of a true premise. So with the remainder of my time, I'd like to address some of these. The misuse of VAERS reports is salient. VAERS is a critical component of our vaccine safety network, and it does a solid job of flagging adverse events for investigation in more robust systems like the VSD. But evidently, that giant disclaimer that one must ascend to have read before accessing VAERS has fallen on deaf ears. VAERS is primarily for hypothesis generation and early warnings of potential safety signals and not a tool to investigate them in and of itself, as reports may be incomplete, coincidental, or even reflect phenomena which never occurred. The incredible Hulk side effect is a famous example, but on a less lighthearted note, a VAERS report was issued months ago describing the death of a three-year-old girl in Virginia following an mRNA vaccine for COVID-19 after a prolonged hospitalization. However, the vaccination in question could not have occurred because it was done before clinical trials were even initiated in her age group. Similarly, many coincidental events will occur. Follow any random group of 10 million Americans for two months and you will see 4,000 heart attacks, 4,000 strokes, 60 diagnoses of multiple sclerosis, 9,500 diagnoses of cancer, and 14,000 deaths. We've now vaccinated 182.4 million Americans, a number that is still far too low. A great many coincidences will occur and seeking a causal link is best left to the experts. The spike protein is not toxic at concentrations in which it's induced by vaccination. It would need to be roughly 10,000 to 100,000 times greater in concentrations than has been found in the plasma vaccinated people to start to reproduce the toxicities associated with it. Similarly, the mRNA vaccines are not associated with blood clots. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is associated with wear-clotting disorder, TPS, at a frequency of about 7 per million doses, being greatest in females younger than age 50. There is no biological plausibility by which these vaccines can spontaneously exert adverse effects months to years after vaccination. The lifetime of any vaccine component is a number measured in hours to days, and the adverse effects should be apparent by then, but out of an abundance of caution, EUA required a median of eight weeks of follow-up, and despite the first individuals receiving their vaccination in March 2020 via the clinical trials, there are no credible reports of occult spontaneous adverse events outside that eight-week window, nor in anyone else, because this is a fantasy invented by anti-vaccine activists to scare people, because when the facts don't support your agenda and you're an amoral narcissist, you lie. Thank you for this time. Please be safe. Please get vaccinated. Uh, thank you for your comment um, and for squeezing it under the wire. Uh, we're going to um, go to Ms., uh, Mrs. Erica DeWald. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Erica DeWald, Director of Strategic Communications and Partnerships at Vaccinate Your Family. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee today. Vaccinate Your Family watches each of your meetings with deep interest, as is our organization's policy to follow ACIP recommendations. They're the basis for our communications with both the public and our immunization partners. Throughout the development of the COVID-19 vaccines, the ACIP and FDA's VRBAC members have remained true to the science. That's no small feat given the many pressures to move quickly and exercise every possible tool to end a devastating pandemic. Once again, as pressure and confusion mounts about the need for a booster dose of COVID vaccine, 
The VRBAC and ACIP have proven the independence of science by not getting ahead of the data available to us. In order to make an informed decision about boosters, however, we need to understand the goals of a booster program in the U.S. We appreciate that Dr. Walensky, the CDC, and this committee is focused on that very issue. Setting a goal can help us better understand the role of a booster program, both for Pfizer and any future recommendations for Moderna or Janssen vaccines. It can also help us better design studies to identify whether our vaccination programs are moving us toward that goal. Additionally, clearly defined goals will help organizations, institutions, and healthcare providers combat misinformation around COVID-19 vaccines, and all vaccines for that matter. We also need to encourage politicians to support, not direct, public health. When the administration announced boosters, the data to support or reject a booster was not yet publicly available, and neither FDA nor CDC had even scheduled meetings of their independent advisory committees. That led to a lot of confusion, and in some communities, mistrust. It further hurt our efforts to promote science-based public health recommendations, including vaccination. Confusion among the public will continue if announcements from political leaders precede that of the independent bodies of the FDA and CDC. It also makes our work communicating clearly about the safety and necessity of vaccines even more difficult because it makes room for deeper division and politicization of a critical public health issue. Now, to clear up this confusion, we need ACIP to provide us clear direction around the definitions of those who are considered high risk and high occupational risk. We're going to need very clear guidelines on who should receive a booster to prevent further confusion among the public and ensure an efficient, timely rollout of these boosters. Don, vaccine recommendations to uphold rigorous processes and communicate the science clearly. This will ensure that the public continues to have faith in the overall vaccination program. Thank you for your careful deliberations and transparency. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Ms. DeWald, for your comments. Uh, next is Dorit Rice. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Dorit Rice. I'm a professor of law at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law, and a vaccine advocate. First, thank you, committee, for your thorough, transparent, and careful work on vaccine generally and COVID-19 vaccine specifically. I want to echo what my colleague Erica said, uh, that sticking to the science is not an easy thing right these days and your presentations provide substantial insight, a lot of information, and I know I always learn a lot as a lay person. Even if most days, not today, you insist on having them at unreasonable East Coast times. I want to reiterate a point made to you by my friend and colleague, Dr. H. Switzer, about two years ago. It's when the science is uncertain that we need your guidance even more when the evidence can go either way. We are hearing experts disagree on the booster question, but a decision is needed one way or the other, and I appreciate your willingness to face the hard decision and make recommendations. I hope that you consider equity at home and abroad when you do that, and not just effectiveness. And I want to follow up both on yesterday's pregnancy data and on Erica's point about the need for clear definition by asking you to consider whether pregnant women should be considered high risk when you make your booster recommendation, even if they don't really fit clearly into other categories. Two suggestions, one, that are not about boosters. One, if you're looking for a place to increase transparency, we, the online advocates, could use a more comprehensive discussion on there's the back end. What happens to report after they're submitted? How are they investigate? How do you avoid duplicates? Because that comes up quite a bit in questions from the vaccine hesitant. Finally, I've said this before, transparency does not require you to provide a forum for all comments. I know that you get a lot of really helpful oral comments, and I would have to miss many of them. For example, Dr. Plotkin's comments last week. And I know many of the comments have been very valuable, but they also know, and you know, that the opportunity to comment has been systematically misused by anti-vaccine activists to create propaganda videos that they use to promote, promote misinformation under the guise of comments to the CDC. Just this week, a comment by a science denier to your sister committee at FDA, VRPAC, that misrepresented COVID-19 vaccine as having high risk, has been shared as the FDA said. We know comments here were used the same way. You're not increasing transparency but by allowing that. And if you want to increase transparency, why not an alternative? You can, for example, set aside half an hour to address the major issues raised in the written comments, uh, potentially also correcting major errors, 
like federal co government does in rulemaking, and that will not only allow you to address comments, it will show that you've heard the comments and give your members an opportunity to consider the issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we will move on to Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. Dr. Cavanaugh. Well, thank you very much. Last Friday's meeting of the FDA's Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee regarding boosters for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine resulted in recommending authorization of boosters for those 65 years of age and older, along with those individuals who are at high risk for severe COVID-19. After the formal vote, a poll was taken and the committee unanimously agreed this recommendation should be extended to healthcare workers and those who are at high risk of occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2. Thus, initially, the committee focused on vaccinated individuals who are biologically high risk of developing severe COVID-19, but finally also recommended boosters for those at high risk of COVID or at high risk of SARS-CoV-2 exposure. However, the degree of exposure is like being pregnant. You either are exposed or you are not. During a raging pandemic, action is needed now. We do not have the luxury of waiting for the results of randomized controlled trials. I would like to encourage the committee to broaden the FDA's recommendations. The following should be considered. First, at least one FDA committee member indicated the main goal was to prevent severe disease, which is defined as hospitalizations or death. However, this ignores the lasting and debilitating effects of long COVID, which can afflict 10 to 30% of those with even mild to moderate infections and pose a significant risk to our population. Second, Dr. Alroy Price, Israel's Director of Public Health Services, testified that the Pfizer booster created a tenfold increase in protection in 40 to 60 year olds. With the disease profile of Delta markedly shifting to younger age groups, providing boosters to a wider range of individuals would be good public health policy. Finally, the United States has, over three, has administered over 386 million doses of vaccines with an extraordinarily good safety record. The FDA committee had concerns regarding myocarditis in the young. However, this is a rare event occurring in approximately one in 5,000 young individuals. And as stated by Dr. Alroy Price, 95% of these cases were not severe. There is a much higher incidence of myocarditis in those who contract COVID-19. In view of the above, I would like to recommend reconsideration of offering Pfizer boosters to all who are 16 years of age or older, or at least offering boosters to those who are 30 years of age and older, plus all individuals who are at risk of SARS-CoV-2 exposure. As a side note, we encourage the flu vaccine to be taken by all, not just those at high risk of severe disease or disease acquisition. We need to be consistent with our messaging. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will move on to Ms. Laura Burns. Ms. Burns. Uh, Ms. Burns, are you uh, able to turn your mic on? Hello, my name is Laura Burns. I'm a double lung transplant recipient and a participant in all four of the Johns Hopkins studies on vaccine efficacy from first dose to fourth. I'm also a member of the Transplant Vaccine Study Committee a group originally formed by study participants now with over 700 members. On behalf of myself and the group, I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for authorizing additional doses last August. Indeed, many of us have been blessed with a dramatic response. Sadly, however, many remain with little or no response and all are still wary. Dr. Cotton spoke eloquently to our situation yesterday. If the committee should decide, as was suggested, that the goal of boosters is to prevent hospitalization and death, not infection, please remember that of the fully vaccinated, we are the ones most likely to be hospitalized and die. Our families are scared to death that they could come home with a mild case, and that so-called mild case will put us in the hospital. According to the FDA's press release yesterday, those covered under today's EUA are healthcare workers, teachers, daycare staff, grocery workers, among others. I'd like to address the term among others and hope you will give it wide latitude. Our families, friends, and colleagues are asked to cocoon us, to protect us by being fully vaccinated. With their immunity waning, 
That means boosters for them, not just additional doses for us. One of our members writes, our family should get boosters. It's critical to us that they don't bring a breakthrough case into our homes. Another, my husband is not quite 65, but lives with me, an immunocompromised person. Sadly, his secretary refuses to get vaccinated. Will he be able to access a booster? Yet another, if a person feels that they need a booster to provide more protection for someone vulnerable to their household, then they should be able to do so without having to go through all kinds of hoops. I agree and I urge you to implement this uh, policy through self-attestation as you did for the immunocompromised. I also hope there will be a speedy way to get a Moderna booster, especially for the elderly. One way would be to simply include the 65 and over among the immunocompromised. The evidence you saw yesterday certainly supports that. Then they could qualify under the current EUAs for both Moderna and Pfizer and get their boosters right away. One last word, please get some help soon to the immunocompromised who got the J&J. They have been left stranded. Thank you so much for all you do and for keeping us in mind during your deliberations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Burns. We'll move on to Ms. Catherine Falk. Hi. Um, hello once more. I'm having a sense of deja vu. My name is Catherine Falk, and as always, I'm a parent and vaccine advocate in Oakland, California. Thank the committee again for all your hard work. I hope you'll be able to continue independently assessing the data and making decisions free of pressure. In a way, it's a more challenging time than it was before. In the last administration, we had someone so hostile to public health, but now we have a president who is in some ways a little too enthusiastic. I would happily get a booster if that ends up being the best course of action, but as a layperson member of the public, I really look to the experts to, to look at what the data shows not just what I wish it would show or fear that it shows. In deciding on who should get boosters, I hope the committee will also keep equity in mind so immunity doesn't become an even greater divide between the have and the have not. I am glad to see you look specifically at how boosters might impact people in nursing homes. I hope there will also be efforts to look at boosters for other vulnerable segments of the population. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, we'll move on to uh, Harold Schmidt. Uh, my name is Harold Schmidt, and I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to congratulate the ACIP chair members, and especially also staff, for once more laying out with such clarity the hard trade-offs we're facing. I'm also grateful to have the opportunity to share two recommendations that I believe matter for allocation, allocating boosters in ways that reduces rather than further increases inequity. And Dr. Walensky rightly emphasized the importance of equity earlier. First, we should allocate boosters by universalizing the use of disadvantaged indices, such as the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. Secondly, and directly related, we should recognize that the vast majority of people eligible for boosters are likely trusted vaccine ambassadors and draw on them and the booster rollout to increase initial vaccinations in disadvantaged areas. At ACIP's last meeting, several members rightly recognized that ethically the case for boosters can be impossible to justify given the global vaccine access disparities. I emphatically agree with the sentiment and there's a clear moral imperative to keep up the pressure for global access and to learn the lessons for the next pandemic. That said, global allocation is not within the ACIP's remit and unfortunately not recommending boosters in the US does not translate into vaccines where they need it more. Still, ACIP's recommendations do in effect with global and national equity and here's how. On April 19, when the entire U.S. became vaccine eligible, the difference between fully vaccinated people in the most and least disadvantaged groups using the CDC Social Vulnerability Index was 4.5%. Currently, it is twice that rate and stands at 9%, 49 versus 58%. Now, in the worst case, these inequities are exacerbated if the U.S. most privileged people swiftly snap up boosters as they're made available, while the more disadvantaged people fall further behind, whether we're talking about the most disadvantaged among the 65-year-olds or among at-risk groups, since neither of these groups is homogeneous. And the same applies once eligibility is widened to other groups. Alternatively, boosters can be used to reduce inequities and help achieve a less unfortunate scenario in terms of global disparity. We can still close the vaccine equity gap using the very metric that shows the disparity, namely disadvantage in disease. Colleagues and I showed in a review available open access in nature medicine earlier this year 
that in the initial vaccine rollout, the majority of states use disadvantaged indices in different ways, including increasing amounts of vaccines for more disadvantaged areas, planning vaccination site locations, and targeted outreach and partnerships. It'd be useful if ACIP recommended that all jurisdictions now adopt disadvantaged indices to promote equity. Plus, we now have tools such as Ariadna Lab's free vaccine equity planner that can identify vaccine deserts and identify facilities in more disadvantaged areas that could potentially serve as vaccination sites. Access is still an issue. Finally, everyone who's eligible for a vaccine is a potentially trusted ambassador. My expertise is not in snappy slogans, but a campaign under titles such as get your booster and bring in an unvaccinated friend or something better should be explored as a priority. Passing up the opportunity to increase first and second doses in rolling out boosters will not help equity. It's hence important to seize the booster opportunity to close the gap in vaccination access across uh, social disadvantage, especially also because it's that simultaneously. Thank you for your gap. comment. Your time has expired. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to Ms. Linda D. Hi, uh, I've been an AIDS activist for 34 years and have learned the importance of evidence based medicine the hard way. I've been a community rep on many FDA CEDAR antiviral advisory committee hearings, provided written comments for both BRPAC and ACIP COVID-19 meetings and oral comments for all but one FDA COVID BRPAC hearing. I've been very impressed with ACIP's deliberations and decision-making process. The committee drills down into many real-world issues and provides answers to extremely important pragmatic questions using a very organized process. That being said, we must acknowledge that the country is trapped in a COVID-19 nightmare. Americans are dazed and confused by vast amounts of data as well as mis- and disinformation. While it is not ACIP's role to create policy, their, their decisions definitely promote policy. I'm here to ask you to help prevent severe COVID and death, transmission, vaccine hesitancy, booster confusion, and possible vaccine administration chaos. ASAP can help promote sound public health policies as well as maintain scientific integrity. You can accomplish this by recommending that the CDC's current list of people with certain medical conditions who are more likely to experience COVID be used as the eligibility criteria for third doses of 162B2. This will provide the states with a familiar framework for booster eligibility as well as more clarity for healthcare providers and a better understanding of complicated information for many communities. We need um, as much uniformity as possible so as not to further confuse the states and, more importantly, the public. I would be remiss if I did not mention that people with HIV uh, would have been entirely excluded, uh, almost entirely excluded, from COVID-19 vaccine access without the actions of HIV activists. People with HIV were initially excluded from the Pfizer and Moderna Phase three trials. They were not included in the CDC's vaccination prioritization category until a few weeks before vaccines were available to the general public. Only a limited portion of people with HIV are included in the current immunocompromised list for third vaccination. The inclusion of people with HIV and their advocates in ACIP or public comment sessions has also been minimal. I urge you to recommend that people with HIV and the many others listed in the current CDC medical conditions criteria for people who are more likely to experience severe COVID be included as one of your eligibility recommendations for third doses, doses of 162B2. I only have time to address one eligibility recommendation. Other recommendations based on the FDA, EUA indication are provided in my written comment. I do support broad eligibility in, in, um, in criteria for all FDA indications and for people of color uh, based on uh, many of the reasons that have already been discussed here today. I'd like to thank you uh, for your dedication and commitment and for the opportunity to comment. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Mr. Brian Wilkins. Hi, I'm Brian A. Wilkins, founder of COVID Legal USA, editor-in-chief of the COVID blog, and a longtime journalist. Everything I'm about to say can be verified and further researched at thecovidblog.com. Dreen Keyes, age 58, died three hours after her first Pfizer mRNA injection, January 30th, 2021, Glochester, Virginia. Sarah Stickles, age 28, died five days after her second Pfizer mRNA injection, February 11, 2021, Beloit, Wisconsin. Benjamin Goodman, age 32, died 24 hours after the Johnson & Johnson viral vector DNA injection, March 14, 2021, New York City. 
Cameron Thomas, age 16, developed blood clots and died 11 days after her first Pfizer mRNA injection, March 30th, 2021, Wenaki, Wisconsin. John Francis Foley, age 21, died 24 hours after the Johnson & Johnson viral vector DNA injection, April 10th, 2021, Cincinnati, Ohio. Griselda Flores, age 61, died 48 hours after her second Moderna mRNA injection, May 3rd, 2021, Orange, California. Jacob Kleinick, age 13, developed myocarditis and died three days after his second Pfizer mRNA injection, June 16th, 2021, Zilwaukee, Wisconsin. James Cooper Sawyer, age 77, died eight days after his third Pfizer mRNA booster, August 28th, 2021, Cookville, Tennessee. The list goes on and on, and this happens in every country across the globe. The CDC chalks all of these deaths up as pure coincidence. The CDC's own database, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, has recorded 14,506 post-injection deaths in 2021 alone. But now the CDC says their own databases are unreliable. The Nobel Prize winning drug ivermectin is now dismissed as quote unquote horse dewormer by mainstream doctors and media. There are more than 66 peer reviewed studies proving that ivermectin is a highly effective treatment and prophylaxis against COVID-19. If you truly cared about public health, you would recommend ivermectin for treatment and prevention protocols and stop the propaganda against this drug. But the CDC receives hundreds of millions of dollars from Pfizer, Bayer, Merck, and other pharmaceutical companies, so you cannot admit the truth and ruin your partner's emergency use authorizations. Further, the FDA receives 45% of its funding from user fees, meaning the fees pharmaceutical companies pay the FDA while seeking approval of their drugs and medical devices. The conflicts of interest are blatant and frankly criminal pursuant to Title 18 of U.S. Code Section 208. It's indisputable fact on statistics from the CDC and Johns Hopkins University that a positive correlation exists between vaccination rates and COVID cases. As the previous rises, the latter rises. In some, I pray that there's enough humanity and critical thinking left on earth for all involved in this global genocide to face Nuremberg type trials. Again, visit thecovidblog.com for more information on everything I just said. Thank you very much for giving me the Thank opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Ms. Sarah Berry. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Thank you. All right. Hello, ACIP. My name is Sarah Berry, and I'm pro-vaccine activist from Ohio, although some of you might know me better by my online handle, 42Believer. Thank you all for continuing to dedicate your time and energy on this critical issue. I'm grateful to share my perspective with like-minded people while simultaneously drawing the ire of the exact same anti-vaccine activists who inspired me to start requesting a spot for public comment in the first place. In my past public comments, I've shared with you all the lengths anti-vax lobbyists went to in an attempt to censor me. Today, I'd like to share with you just how strong a hold anti-vax lobbyists are having on the legislative process in Ohio and update you on what the future holds for anti-vaccine legislation in the Buckeye State. First is HB 248. HB 248 is a bill that would make it illegal for anybody to require any vaccine, not just a COVID vaccine. A FOIA request revealed that not only was the language of HB 248 created with the help of anti-vaxxers, but the amendments made to the bill were also made because of anti-vaxxers. Further FOIA requests of text messages combined with some Facebook sleuthing proved to me not, that not only was the language of the bill written by anti-vax lobbyists, but they were significantly involved in the hearing process for HB 248. On May 21st, Representative Jennifer Gross texted the chairman of the health committee, Scott Lips, referencing the anti-vax lobbyists. She claimed that they are, quote, picking and choosing and promising witnesses without discussing it with me, unquote, and also that they, quote, decided the schedule, unquote. After reviewing Facebook comments, a member of that same lobbyist group who attended a meeting with Gross and Lips said that the changes to testimony protocol were discussed in that meeting. Every time I went to submit my own testimony for HB 248, I was denied the opportunity to give in-person testimony. Although I don't have direct evidence of them using this new process to censor me yet again, I'm smart enough to read between the lines. Fortunately, HB 248 is dead thanks to Sherry Tenpenny turning Ohio into a national laughingstock with her unhinged testimony and the subsequent infighting amongst the anti-vax lobbyists. Unfortunately, anti-vax sentiments are still percolating in the Ohio legislature. Multiple other bills targeting vaccine requirements have been introduced. And as I speak, there are plans by the Republican leadership to introduce their own version of such a bill. I have even heard that they plan to bring this new bill to a floor vote, quote, as early as next week, unquote, which would certainly not give me or anybody else the requisite time to speak in opposition. Since I feel I have no other option, this is my public plea to Representative Bob Cup, Representative Tim Ginter, Representative Bill Seitz, 
Representative Rick Carfagna, Representative Don Jones, and Representative Cindy Abrams. I was born and raised in Ohio, and I've watched with dismay as anti-vax lobbyists plant misinformation in the minds of your colleagues. I urge you to reject anti-vax legislation that goes against public health, and that includes any bill that interferes with employers' right to keep the workers and customers safe. I thank ACIP once again, and I urge all Americans to pay attention to their state legislatures, lest they become as anti-vaccine as Ohio has. Thank you for your comment. Um, and with that, our public comment session is now closed. Um, I did want to acknowledge uh, uh, that during the session, our colleague, uh, Dr. Sanchez, uh, was able to join. So Dr. Sanchez, are you able to state your name, affiliation, and whether you have any conflicts? Thank you, Dr. Lee. This is uh, Pablo Sanchez, I'm Professor of Pediatrics, uh, Neonatology and Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Nationwide Children's Hospital, Ohio State University and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And with that, we have all 15 members present. Um, we will now uh, take a, a recess until 1 p.m. So uh, please plan to join us back at 1 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>